is my pleasure again to welcome today uh, Oya Jelik Tutan here in our center. She is a senior lecturer at King's College in uh, London, where she's heading the Social AI and Robotics Lab. And she is specializing on uh, the uh, understanding and generation of human behavior, on learning from interactions and for interaction, generally speaking, in, in multimodal models from human interactions. And she takes this model and puts them into perception systems, into control systems, and for real worlds. She is really much interested in social robotics, but she also has very strong activities generally in uh, sequential decision taking and in task learning. Um, before King's College, she was at Imperial College in Queens, Queen Mar at Queen Mary and where Thank Cambridge. You. Um, she had won mul uh, multiple awards, uh, recently uh, the best paper award at Roman 2022 as far as I remember. And she also uh, did her PhD internship here at the center with uh, Florent at one point. So we are very happy to see her again and the floor is all yours, Oya. Oh, yeah. um, thank you very much uh, for the uh, introduction. I need to, based on the instructions, I need to keep the microphone like this for audio quality. Uh, even though it doesn't feel uh, natural, but so first of all, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, as uh, Christian said, I'm so excited to come back here uh, after so many years. And um, over the years, my research, because when I was doing a PhD here, I was a PhD student, mainly focusing on computer vision, but over the years, many things has changed. And I am more and more excited about assistive robotics. And I am very interested in building algorithms that can uh, enable robots to assist people at physical, social, and cognitive levels. And I'm also very, uh, my research is very multidisciplinary. I collaborate with uh, researchers from many other disciplines. And my motivation also comes from my one-to-one -one interactions with the uh, users, people with spatial needs. For example, a couple of years ago, we released a video uh, of the uh, Toyota HSR robot. Uh, we brought it to an individual's uh, home who had the motor neuron disease. And then after this uh, video release, I've re been approached by many people who had motor neuron disease and they asked me about whether a robot like this available, can we buy it because it looks very cool. Unfortunately, I couldn't give them the positive answer because everybody in this room, I'm sure you know that this is extremely uh, complex task to have robots at the moment to really uh, to, to interact and coexist in human complex and diverse human environments. And uh, for, for with this, uh, I would like to refer to the gardeners, these multiple intelligences. So in the morning that we have talked about kinesthetic intelligence and also spatial intelligence. And uh, I would like to mention about my resource. I don't, I mainly focus on like, uh, very interested in kinesthetic intelligence as well. So we look at, for example, this year, whether can we transfer policies with robots that have different uh, embodiments. And also we look at problems have uh, robots can learn skills, uh, missing skills to complete a task. Also, I am very much interested in continued learning and which is also very important for robotics. But in this talk, I am going to talk about, uh, which is, I believe, very important, is about uh, interpersonal intelligence, which I also call uh, social intelligence. Because it's, we are going to use robots in human environments that we need the combination and relationship all of these different intelligences. And my motivation again comes from our uh, recent uh, EU project, which is uh, socially acceptable extended reality models and systems, that uh, the idea with this project that the uh, goal that to build a modular architecture that can interact with people to provide them service in public spaces or have with their training. But we say that so the system should not be only functionally complex and useful, so it should, of course, satisfy the needs and the requirements of the user, but at the same time, it should be socially acceptable. So the problem is that we don't have a clear definition yet, but this is kind of a, like a working definition. So first of all, does this kind of systems should be in compliance with the social context it is being used. For example, if it is going to be used in Europe, it is different. If it is going to be in used in Asia, 
culture, it is different, etc. It has to follow different uh, social conventions. And at the same time, you should be to be able to accept it and trust it, it should be transparent, safe and explainable. And what we want to achieve is actually to achieve a smooth interaction between the humans and the robots. And of course, we are taking inspiration from human-human communication uh, because this is how we interact with each other. And if you are going to interact with humans, that then the human behavior is the most natural guide. So for this, in this talk, I am going to give uh, three example projects which is associated with this concept of social acceptance. So the first project that I am going to talk about is uh, social awareness which has been already uh, briefly mentioned this morning, uh, that what social awareness means basically whether the robot should understand human behavior and adapt and respond appropriately. And I'm going to give an example from our research about navigation. So social awareness navigation is a very hot topic. There are many people working on it and we have already seen some examples from this morning. Uh, but what we want to achieve is actually we want to focus on like scenarios that you see uh, on the top, maybe it is not so uh, clear, but it is like a, imagine a cocktail party scenario or a, like a very big conference, ICCV conference poster session. So how a robot can socially navigate in an environment like this. And uh, here, uh, for example, in a, like a cocktail party scenario that we take inspiration from psychology that people tend to form groups. For instance, they tend to a uh, formation groups that, is, that are shown uh, over there. They might be like interacting face to face or side by side and etc. So the basic question that we try to answer in this, quest, uh, in this uh, special work is, uh, imagine that the robot is navigating in this social environment. So it comes across as two people and if they are talking each other, so whether it should go in between them or not. Probably if they are talking, of course, the robot should not go in between them, but maybe if it is so crowded, it should, but maybe it should apologize. And so the idea is that, first of all, there was not so much work uh, in this area, especially uh, from robots' perspective, that we uh, took our robot and we attending a party, and it was uh, like a party taking place in our department, and we recorded people uh, using the robot's onboard cameras that you can see an example here that the robot is navigating when people are conversing each other and having chat and etc. And we use the robot's onboard sensor, so this is why it is not very high quality and you can see as compared to human, it is a very uh, narrow uh, field of view and it is very challenging. And then we annotated this uh, videos with respect to these conversational groups that I mentioned before, uh, frame by frame. And as I said, the first question that we wanted to answer, whether looking at these videos, can we detect the conversational group? And here we a modular approach that we first uh, use the, because the robot has other uh, sensors as well, LiDAR and the depth information. So we use this information to detect people in the scene and to use RGB and the depth images to extract features and detect them. And then once we have detected the people, we wanted to detect these uh, conversational groups and we formulated as a, like a graph uh, problem that you can see here, the nodes can be the uh, people in the graph, uh, the nodes can be uh, the people in the scene. And the idea is to just predict whether two people are in the same group or not. And what we did is different from the previous work is that we learned the, not the only the pairwise relationship, but we uh, applied a, a representation learning on the, uh, using the graph neural networks that can help us to uh, learn the information, not only the person which is closest to the target person, but the any number of person in their neighborhood. And we fit this information uh, together with their individual features to predict whether uh, they are connected or not. And differently, again, we started a, like a top-down approach. We assumed that the, now the uh, graph is all connected and by using like supervised learning, we eliminated the edges which doesn't exist uh, if they are the people, they are not in the same group. 
So by using this, you, uh, we were able to improve the performance. There are not so many works in this area, as you can see. So, uh, but there is like some uh, sample visualization results, and we were using this uh, representation learning technique and using the top-tone approach. We were able to improve performance uh, on both. Uh, on this data set, which is called Salsa, which is a third person uh, static data set, but also on our data set, which is a dynamic data set, and it's the first person uh, perspective data set. Okay, now sh to close the loop, now we detected the conversational groups. How uh, can, can we uh, how can we use this information to teach the robot to navigate in this space? And also, most importantly, how we can evaluate social awareness or social acceptance such a navigation uh, policy. And very simply, that I will just very simply, very just a proof of concept study that is still going on. First of all, we don't have simulations, proper simulations to uh, train the agents to navigate in these spaces. And there are some social aware navigation is a very big domain, and there are many simulations, but none of them were appropriate for or uh, these specific problems like understanding conversational group and navigating between them. And what we did it is actually we uh, took the croft board simulation, which is uh, already widely used technique, and then we combined it with real data from the data sets that you saw, especially from the SASA data set, and then we created our own data set. And as you can see, we have created two scenarios. One is the cocktail party scenario, and the other one is the poster session scenario. And the goal is here, there is like a uh, randomly uh, selected goal that the robot needs to reach that call in this random position between the crafts. Okay, so it's like just a really basic idea that we have uh, used this simulation to train the agent using a, like a, you can use any reinforcement learning algorithm, but in this case we use the actor critic learning algorithm. And here what we did it differently. This was a based on a baseline method which was proposed on 2020. And what we introduced is this concept of conversational groups, and we included an additional reward which we call social interaction reward. What uh, a lot robot to uh, uh, like approach the groups in an appropriate manner, but when the scene is so crowded, it is also allowed the robot to cross the uh, group, but at the same time penalizes it. Okay, so as I said, evaluating these techniques is uh, very, very another uh, complicated topic, but there is already, there was a paper in the beginning of uh, this year specifically focusing on uh, evolution of social uh, uh, aware navigation in a broader uh, context. But for this specific problem that we proposed or on, uh, evaluation framework that you can see it is composed on both quantitative metrics it can be like whether the robot completed the task successfully but also how what was the distance to the humans whether it violated the conversational groups and etc and we also recorded these uh, videos uh, from the uh, robot uh, navigating in this crowded environment in the simulation and ask people to watch these videos and then the rate the uh, social intelligence of the robot uh, with respect to the different uh, navigation strategies and we even also ask uh, people to whether they can discriminate between human and uh, agents navigating in the same environment by just using a, a navigation training test. Overall, the results like now the preliminary results show that actually even though our algorithm cannot uh, obtain the better, like perform the task successfully as compared to the other method, it is more socially acceptable when it is necessary. Uh, it can cross the groups, but also it uh, respects the social conventions and it is more evaluated as human-like. And as I like a takeaway, few takeaway messages from this project is, uh, first of all, uh, that when we are designing social uh, aware navigation systems, so we shouldn't just only focus on avoidance behaviors, but also we should go beyond them and we try to understand what is the happening in the scene, what is happening in the social scene, and how you can how robots can use this information uh, to uh, develop social acceptable strategies. And also, we shouldn't be only rely on quantitative metrics because qualitative uh, metrics is also very important uh, because we want not be able to describe everything is, uh, quantitatively. Therefore, we also need to recruit people, target users, and then also collect their impressions.
And finally, in this work, we approach like use a, like a modular method that the people detection and group detection and navigation they all handled separately. Uh, but maybe and and approaches can be explored as discussed in the morning as well. And um, uh, so this is also a point of discussion. Okay, so now I would like to continue with another example from our ongoing research, which is also related to social acceptance and is about like uh, naturalness and the lifelikeness of the robots. And this is also very important because one of the uh, definition of the social acceptance is uh, whether um, uh, because people tend to accept a system more socially acceptable if they see it is consistent with their self-image and it is an extension of their themselves. And similarly if you are going to, for example, design motions for the robots, we also need to get inspiration from human behaviors, and we need to look at how natural and how human-like their behaviors. But before going uh, to that talk, I would like to talk about also imitation learning a little bit that we have explored a, a small problem that, uh, which is focusing on whether that is already discussed in the morning because these humans, they have this remarkable ability, ability that they can simply watch someone and then they can do the same movements or they perform a task very easily. And in one of the works that we focused on, whether we can do this without using any prior information, anything, any, nothing, just give the visual raw information to the agent and whether it can figure out to imitate the behavior of an expert uh, doing the task in a different domain. This is extremely difficult because, uh, first of all, the visual differences might be really big between the experts and agents' domain. But also, imagine that if a robot with one arm is like to imitate a human, then their embodiment is different. Therefore, there are many challenges. And for the rest of this section, I will be uh, going through the GAN uh, uh, formulation, then I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, our method was based on this RL-GAN framework, where it was like formulated as an adversarial game, and here you are already familiar probably, but there are two modules, and there is one, the first one being the discriminator, so discriminator tries to discriminate the demonstration from the expert and the demonstration from the agent, uh, and then it produces an output score, which can be represented as a learned pseudo award. And then policy takes this information and helps the agent to make its demonstration and behavior uh, better and better so that, um, so that the uh, discriminator cannot discriminate anymore uh, the demonstrations from the Uh, okay, welcome back. <laughs> so what, what I was saying is that uh, we um, uh, focused on this visual imitation learning problem that our work was uh, based on the RL GAN framework that I already explained that the discriminator and the policy, the role of the policy. And of course, what we want to, of course, there are like many problems here because here we don't want the discriminator to learn uh, the visual differences the, the, of the environments of the agents and the expert, but instead we want to learn it to learn meaningful information which is related to task being performed. And achieving this is not straightforward. And what we did in this work was to design a new discriminator where we pr pr propose to divide the discriminator into two modules, which one is the preprocessor, pr the preprocessor, and then the invariant discriminator. And then what the preprocessor does, it takes the observations and then map them, then output, uh, like um, uh, I would say, the uh, parameters of a like a Gaussian distribution, and then this should be the samples from distribution should be domain invariance, and then these are taken by the uh, invariant discriminator as a sequence, and then it outputs the intended scores that can be used uh, for the uh, next step. And what here is important that how we can the key question is how we can achieve this domain invariance that we also achieve this by focusing on further constraints, intru introducing further constraints. For example, uh, first of all, we limit the information. We looked at the mutual information between the experts and the agents' domains, and we limit the uh, information that can be 
uh, retained uh, from uh, these uh, domains, but also because we were like using a simulation and we were <laughs> we have accessed a lot of data and we collected a lot of data uh, where the, neither the expert and the agent they were doing any tasks and then we use also uh, this information uh, as a, uh, another learning signal to uh, achieve our task. And here are some of the results that we compared it with that there was another uh, state-of-the-art uh, approach that in general uh, we showed that our method can work very well even there are like significant domain differences between the agents and expert domains uh, but also there are also in terms of the embodiment uh, differences between them and we tried and showed this method can work uh, with uh, both low-level uh, tasks and also high-dimensional high control tasks. Okay, now uh, here again, I am going to, oops, sorry, this shouldn't be, sorry, just, okay, that video should be muted, I think hope the uh, videos are muted, oh, hopefully, I didn't check the settings of my <laughs> presentation after I transferred. So yeah, so now uh, in the previous problem, because we have a, like a task and we can see it, but imagine how we can imitate social human behaviors. It is extremely difficult because even we don't know, uh, we don't have again the, uh, the definitions and even we don't know most of the time why we are doing it. And more specifically, I would like to uh, focus on nonverbal communication. For example, when people interact with uh, each other, they produce co-gestures, uh, co-speech gestures. And these are very powerful along with the words and the facial expressions because it also helps the people to communicate better and understand each other better. So my video is, uh, I don't know how I can fix it, but um, so can I just mute the, mute the laptop, would it be possible? Okay. So what I wanted to show is then as a, like an example, for example, you can see different uh, communication scenarios, one agreement and disagreement. And in these scenarios, the people, they are, their behavior is completely different when they are uh, generating these both gestures and facial expressions. So how we can uh, imitate such kind of behaviors with robots uh, is very complicated, but also I think it's very important uh, because if we are going to use the robots in human environments, but of course I'm not uh, claiming that all robots should display this kind of uh, behaviors, but for example, a receptionist robots or a, like a robot in a cafe setting, etc. they should be also able to display this kind of uh, gesture so that they are more human-like and then they can be like more socially acceptable. And even we have shown that uh, actually it doesn't need to be a humanoid robot. It can be also any shape, like even in like a simple uh, human likeness, people tend to interact with them and then also form connections with robots if they display this kind of uh, nonverbal behaviors. And what we did it, uh, here that we have an exhibition in Science Gallery London that we collaborated with creative um, uh, robotics company, Air Giants, and we applied these techniques with a robot, as you can see here, like a Christmas tree shape. So, going back to our problem that how we can uh, generate co-speech gestures, uh, there is a lot of community, there is a big community on this domain and there are many people working on this topic and this is only just one example and mainly the people are focusing on like single person co-speech gestures but they are not taking into account the interaction context and what we wanted to explore that whether we can uh, generate this kind of normal behaviors in interaction context because it is much more um, appropriate for the scenarios for human agent interaction or human robot interaction and we started our journey with participating in ICCV challenge and uh, we got a, like a, we, we were we couldn't make it so good because it was so a uh, complicated problem here. The idea was that you observe a window like four seconds that two people are interacting with each other. And then the idea is that you want to predict what will be the nonverbal behaviors of the person in the next uh, two seconds. And we tried many things because it's also used automatically detecting landmark points and uh, joints, skeleton joints. It was so complicated to work with this data. And what we worked for us in the end that we have designed different decoders for different body parts because their dynamics are different and this is how we were uh, managed to obtain some good results. 
And then uh, we have a standard study. We started then uh, wanted to explore this further, and then we uh, focused on uh, whether we can uh, like generate this whole body movements that uh, focused on two people interacting with each other. This time we use the motion capture data, and again we hear uh, uh, the context, which meaning that whether whether they are agreements or a disagreement scenario, because people tend to show uh, different. Uh, behaviors in this kind of scenarios and or uh, solution was incorporating this kind of context and we use just the again uh, architecture that you, see, you can see here that which takes an input to what the interaction partner is saying and what is the their what kind of behaviors they are doing and then the uh, given the audio of the target person to generate the uh, relevant cause gestures so then we took our robot, we implemented with our robot uh, in many scenarios, different scenarios that, oops, okay, so it's a bit behaving differently my PowerPoint presentation, apologize for that, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so hope it will be okay. <laughs> And then we also took to like implemented this kind of strategies with robots and then took them and then evaluated in the wild. Uh, fortunately, uh, there are people, they tend to really like the robots with nonverbal gestures, but they couldn't really understand the difference between the rule-based and the data-driven approaches. And maybe I should continue with the, in the interest of time, I need to continue with the takeaway messages. First of all, this is a very challenging problem because it is not one-to-one -one mapping problem, it is one-to-many mapping problem. It depends on culture, it depends on many factors, and uh, fortunately, uh, unfortunately there is a lack of data. And recently we introduced a data set that we recorded people when they are interacting with each other, that we recorded them using motion capture data, depth data, and uh, like uh, depth cameras, and all sorts of like ice case tracker to understand their nonverbal behaviors and also we consider different interaction scenarios whether they are like wayfinding or collaborating on a scenario and our results also supported that the context is very important uh, we need to gesture create the gestures uh, based on the context and finally, uh, another, as I said, the context is so important. And recently, we also participated in another challenge. Unfortunately, we couldn't win it. Uh, but uh, what we introduced is was, again, introducing this context the role of the target person, whether they are speaking or listening. And we have used another data set in this setting, again, motion capture data, which is talking with hands data set. And here, the idea that, that we have, uh, this time we use another method, not uh, like a gun-based uh, architecture, and we use like attention mechanisms uh, to also align the speech and the gestures and our solution was better in terms of the generating the listening behaviors but not very good at uh, generating the speaking behaviors and if you are curious what was the winning method was the diffusion models Okay, so I think this is the last part of my talk. That's uh, the last item in the menu is the, uh, as I said, it's another concept which is really related to social acceptance is the uh, transparency. And we need to, if we are going to use the robots in human environments, they need to explain their behaviors to their human users. And very briefly, that I would like just go to uh, that we have uh, introduced a, like a explanation types in human robot interaction scenarios, which is going to come out soon. This paper that we investigate and look at all the problems and the scenarios that are used uh, for generating explanation. And uh, in this work, also we also propose a framework how we can evaluate the uh, explanation. But in this particular uh, less in the last minutes of this talk I'd want to just focus on very uh, brief problem that we looked at what we are looking at is the problem of uh, when and what explanations we should uh, generate and we are proposing this to be able to understand when generating an explanation we need to take into account again the behaviors of the human and we here we are just focused on very uh, a computer game maybe you have already played this game before overcooked and uh, we asked people to play a game with the agent and we recorded their behaviors like gaze patterns on the screen and we wanted to investigate whether using they are looking at only their gaze patterns can we identify the moments that the user needs an explanation something for example if something is going wrong can we identify that and the agent can deliver an explanation 
And here comes the how the experiment. There are a human and an agent. Uh, they are interacting with each other and they are like have time limitations and they have score and etc. So they need to deliver an order. And of course, to eliciting in a scenario like this, how we can elicit uh, this kind of confusion or um, error scenarios that we have designed, uh, programmed or agent uh, to elicit uh, this kind of behaviors. For example, sometimes we uh, hit some of the items so that the human would not be able to find it and they will be get confused. And also we looked at like we made the agent to make errors uh, sometimes uh, so that the person can uh, again confused and then this is a moment also that maybe the agent can uh, identify by looking at the gaze patterns and deliver an explanation. So again, just, just briefly, so our hypothesis was confirmed that we have found that actually when everything is going very smoothly, people, they tend to look at their own agent, but when there is an error, they looked at the uh, agent itself, the other agent, autonomous agent, their collaborator, and when uh, they are confused, they look all around the screen because they don't know what to do next. And we use this information to actually to classify these moments so that the agents can understand when to deliver an explanation and when, what should be the content of this explanation, whether it should be, uh, for example, related to error, agent error, or the, uh, related to user confusion. And we also extended this work with robots, trying to also explain because it was uh, focusing on uh, 2D uh, game here. And then we are also explaining uh, similar scenarios, uh, scenarios with the robots as well. Okay, so I think this is my last slide that I would like to continue. That's uh, that maybe giving just a, like a general takeaway message that if we are going to use the robots in real environments, so we need to really go beyond the uh, verbal messages like and logs, uh, interaction logs, and we really need to understand human behavior. And we can use this information, for example, in this work that we use it for generating explanations, so using just social signals, but it can be also used for agents to. Uh, also learn uh, how then they are collaborating with the humans to improve their behavior. And with this, I would like to thank my developing group and everybody supported our research so far. And this is the end of my talk, and I'm sorry for all the technical problems. <laughs> Um, any questions in the room? I was already looking in the right direction. <laughs> Immediately, I knew where to go. Just because you are looking at me. Um, I have, a, uh, in fact, most, uh, it's, it's more a remark. In fact, in the, in the field of uh, co-verbal generation, you suppose that the, the, the verbal um, performance is, is given already. So you just plug co-verbal gestures, mainly beat, beat gestures and head movements and also on, on, a, on a natural uh, speech. So you, you think that speech is a driving signal, that the co-verbal is just plugged on this, in the classical domain and also end-to-end -end models. But normally what we want... Simultaneous. Simultaneous. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good so time. It's good, good point. So, yeah, in, in this one, we didn't uh, use the textual information. So, we just used the audio information. We extracted features from audio and to try to. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good point, and I think it's a very promising research direction. In fact, um, I have to say, you, you don't address the same way to different persons. So, this morning, this model uh, towards the your emotion in different ways. So, how it's fitting in your in your in your perspective? Yeah, so really adapting. Yes, uh, so uh, as I said, so this is like the, the main leg at the moment that we don't have data. 
because this is so, especially the cold speed gestures is very culturally dependent. And we don't enough data to cover all the cultures as well, because it's really different how people produce gestures based on the culture. And uh, it's, it's like, we need data, <laughs> but it's also a problem, like chicken egg problem. No questions. Um, I didn't check online because it doesn't show up on my phone. So if somebody could check. Uh. Okay. Um, I have one question, which is just a follow up what uh, Gerard just said. So in robotics, it, it's generally accepted that we don't, don't have as much data as, as people have in NLP or in computer vision, for example. And people are asking questions, when does the uh, ImageNet moment come for robotics, right? Am I right to say that in social robotics it's even worse and you yes. have one order of magnitude even less data, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have the social component, you have the human constraints, you need to not only film buildings, mm -hmm. you actually need to film people. Yes. So is, this is Am I, am I right in saying this is yes, what holding, yes. holding you back, right? It's uh, totally right. And also, it is not all about its privacy, responsible innovation, and everything is like much more complicated uh, topic because you can't just randomly record people as well. Okay. Yeah, I thought so. Just, just a remark. <laughs> I think it's uh, also a take-home take message, at least, at least from me, is that... that um, when you consider this problem of many-to-many -many interactions, we have many people interacting with many people. We are, we are taking the problem of the wrong way. We try, in fact, you, 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 for example, you have TED Talks, where we try, you try, in fact, to, uh, to model personalities, so different uh, TED uh, speakers. And I feel for the robot, the problem is different. It's, not a, it's a one to many people. So it's to a, to a data that provides one personality adapting to different interlocutors. So one person, it's more a problem of one too many. So, to, so how to characterize the policy that the people, one people, one guy or one female, um, in fact, um, implements to, to adapt to different people and not how, what are the diversity of behaviors in the population. So what is your opinion on what yeah, yeah, so I, I, t I totally agree. So I also worked on uh, in the past how we can generate personalities for robots as well. And uh, it is, uh, as you said, it is just, uh, for example, well, most of the works that you see here, they are using also speaker ID. And they are just, it is so difficult to identify that is uh, the gestures, which is like not invariant all cultures or at least different personalities that we can use for robots uh, to generate. And even it is so complicated problem, we can't really uh, disambiguate what is personality, what, because it's just gestures are created by many factors like personality, individual differences, cultural differences, and the context and everything. And it's so difficult to disambiguate all of these factors and then uh, create something. It's a very challenging task. I think we have more <laughs> work to do. I have one more question. Sure. Can somebody or can a robot be too socially acceptable? And in this, with this, I mean that if you could, pu if you push this very far, I mean you gave the example of the robot. Um, should I go through between the people or not? Right. I mean, for me, the obvious question was no. Well, well, how can it even be yes? No, people are talking. Let's not go through. Right. But if you if you push this a little bit further then if there are lots of people, at some point, the robot needs to go someplace, right? I mean, the need, all robot needs to solve its task, so it needs to be, um, needs to do some actions which might be perceived by some people of offensive, not, not, so how do you solve this problem of at some point you need to actually impose your will and make people uh, move away to, to, to do stuff? Sorry, maybe I couldn't make it clear, but this is what we try to do basically with this social interaction award. It was also a low if the environment is so crowded, like imagine a poster yeah. session, uh, session, poster session scenario that it is so crowded. So what hum a human would do, most of the human that they apologize and then they 
go right. in between the groups. So we tried to make the same. We allowed robot to go in between the groups, but we penalized it because it had to do it if, if there is no other option left. Okay, right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, yes, one more question. Uh, I would be delighted to discuss how you define a group. So um, I work at SNCF and um, we have about the same issue um, to define what a group is when we discuss about luggages, especially abandoned uh, luggages, uh, which is a cause of delay. Uh, it's uh, very annoying uh, for uh, travelers, but also for the company. And um, if we can define a group, then we can associate a luggage, a backpack, um, a handbag um, to that group. And if one of the person in the group goes to the toilet to buy a coffee, to buy something, well, away from that group, uh, we are not going to detect that luggage as abandoned or as uh, stolen uh, because we were able to attach that piece of luggage to a group of person, a new entity, instead of one person. So I would be very uh, delighted to discuss that and how do you do that uh, with you. Yeah, so uh, in this case, we looked at the conversational groups. I think uh, you mean also by group that people, they group traveling together. Probably you can just do it by looking at their whether their pose and whether they are uh, looking at each other and detecting their pose. And as I said that I have shown, we get inspiration from the psychology theory. There is this affirmation theory when people are interacting with each other, they form specific groups like circular, side by side, um, also like face to face. And you can look at of this kind of information to detect who is uh, in the same group. And then you can also follow them uh, by using using their um, uh, IDs, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. Thank thank you. Let's thank the OEA again. Thank you.